Most of what we do the rest of the semester is going to be in three-dimensional space. And a lot of this you probably know already, but I'm going to start at the beginning um, just in case it's new to anybody. Okay, when we have three dimensions, that means there's going to be three axes. And they're generally called the X, Y, and Z axis. Okay, the normal way of doing it is to be having the Y axis drawn horizontal with the positive direction being right and the negative direction being left. Like we normally draw the X axis in two dimensions. The Z axis is normally drawn vertical with the positive direction being up and the negative direction being down, like we usually draw the y-axis when we're doing two dimensions. Okay, and then the x-axis is meant to be coming straight out of the page. Obviously we can't draw that on a two-dimensional screen perfectly, so it, we draw it at about a 45 degree angle. It's the best we can do, but in your mind, I want you to imagine that that's coming straight out at you, okay? And this program I'm using draws that third, well, may, you might say first axis, the x-axis, draws it uh, dashed. It, that's just because of the program I'm using. It's not normally that way. That would usually all be solid, okay? Now for the x-axis, the direction coming out at you is usually labeled as the positive direction. And the direction pointing backwards behind the screen is usually called the negative direction. Okay? Now one thing I want you to think of is that x-axis and y-axis are just like the axes that you're used to drawing. when we've learned calculus up to this point. Okay, it's just that they're laying down. So it's like taking this, let's call this a sheet of paper, okay, and you lay it down and that sheet of paper is right there, okay? That's called the XY plane. Okay, now Every point in three dimensions will have three coordinates. Okay, what if I put a point right here? It'll be labeled with three coordinates, A, B, C, let's call those numbers. But the first one's the X coordinate, the second one is the Y coordinate, and the third one is the Z coordinate. Always in that order, very important. Now, just by looking at that, it's really hard for our eyes to tell where that point actually is. It, it is, in fact, pretty much impossible, okay, because we're taking a three-dimensional picture that's been smashed to two dimensions. If I draw in some extra lines there, I think it will help, okay? So let's, let's draw a line from there down to the point on the XY plane that is directly below it. Okay? And then from there, from that point, let's draw a line straight across to the X axis and another line straight back to the Y axis. Okay, so you I'm hoping your mind can visualize that, those red lines, the solid ones there, it's forming a rectangle on the XY plane. And that blue point is hovering above that one corner of the rectangle. Okay, so the X coordinate, I mean, uh, yeah, the X coordinate, which is A, what that is, is that's this X coordinate right here the y-coordinate b, sorry, the y-coordinate b is right here, 
okay? And the Z coordinate C is right if I were to draw a line straight back to the Z axis would be there. Okay, and it it takes uh, it takes some time to get used to your mind visualizing those three dimensions. Okay. All right, now I want to give you um, a few updated equations, like how do you do the distance formula in three dimensions, and how do you write what's a what's a three dimensional analog of a circle would be a sphere. I want to show you how to write equations for those. Okay, these are very very straightforward. It's just a matter of memorizing. Okay, so this is the distance formula. In three dimensions, let's say we have the point x1, x2, no, sorry, I'm just not at all. I, I neither said nor wrote what I meant. Uh, x1, y1, z1. Okay, and then we have another point, x2, y2, z2. Okay, how would you write the distance between those? Well, it's very similar to the distance formula in two dimensions, okay? It's going to be the square root of the difference between the x-coordinates squared plus the difference between the y-coordinates squared plus the difference between the z-coordinates squared. Okay? The equation of a sphere, which is like a ball, with center let's call the center ABC okay and radius R is very similar to the equation of a circle in two dimensions. Very similar, okay? It's going to be x minus a squared plus y minus b squared plus z minus c squared equals the radius squared. Okay, whenever you see an equation like that, you need to know that you're looking at a sphere the center is the point A, B, C, and the radius is the number R. Okay? All right. Let's talk about planes. Okay, look at these three pictures here, okay? In the first one, you have the XY plane being highlighted there. In the second one, you have the YZ plane. That's the plane made by the axes, the Y axis and the Z axis. Okay? And that would be like flat against the screen, kind of. And then you have the XZ plane is made by the X axis and the Z axis. That's coming straight out at us. But what I want to add to this is the um, equations for those. Okay, look at the XY plane. What's the equation of that plane? Well, what does every point on that plane have in common? One thing and one thing only. Every point on that plane has a z-coordinate of zero. So the equation of that plane is z equals zero. 
because that's what all the points on the plane have in common, a z-coordinate of 0. Okay, what is the equation, do you think, of the yz plane in the middle picture? Well, just ask yourself, what do all those points on that plane have in common? They have one thing in common, which is they all have an x-coordinate of 0. So the yz plane has an equation, and the equation is x equals 0. So you could probably guess what's the equation of the xz plane. Of course, it would be y equals 0, right? Because that's what all these points on the plane have in common. They have a y-coordinate of 0. How about a plane like this? Let's make sure you're understanding that picture. It's, it's not entirely obvious, but I think you'll see it if I point it out. Do you notice that, um, let's see here. This part of the x-axis right there is not as solid as this one. Do you notice that? Let me get rid of those colors now so you can see it. The part of the x-axis behind the two is a little bit, uh, oh, you mm, can't quite see it as well, right? But starting at the 2, the, the part of the x-axis in front of that 2 is darker. So what they're trying to draw, and I think they're doing a pretty good job of it, is they're trying to draw there, that's a plane that is perpendicular to the x-axis. And the x-axis is puncturing through that plane right at the coordinate of 2 on the x-axis. Okay, and then that plane spreads out in the y and z directions. So what do you think the equation of that plane would be? It would be x equals 2, because every point on that plane has that one thing in common. Every point on that plane has an x-coordinate of 2. Okay, now let me draw a picture with two planes. Let's look at that one, okay, and let's see if you can recognize it. I don't mean the equation, but I mean can you can you see the can you visually um, get the orientation of those planes there? Those planes are perpendicular to the y-axis. It didn't, it didn't label them where, they're, where the y-axis is puncturing. Let's just say that this right here is 5. And let's call this right there negative 3 on the y-axis, okay? So this plane is the plane what? y equals negative 3. This plane is the plane y equals 5. Now, what if I wanted an equation for both planes? An equation where when I graphed the equation, I got those two planes as my graph. How would I do that? Well, I suppose you could say y equals negative 3 or y equals 5. Do you understand that it should not be and? It would not be this. That would be wrong <clears throat> because, first of all, it's impossible for something to equal both negative 3 and 5. That's an impossibility. So that, that's one reason why it should be or instead of and, but also because if I ask you to graph something, the equation is supposed to describe the points, right? So if I put some points here and other points over here, and I said to you, what do all of the points, both planes, what do all of them have in common? You would say this is what they have in common. 
they all have a y coordinate of negative 3 or 5. Okay? All right, so that's a good start, but however, that's two equations, not one, right? Do you notice that I could rewrite y equals negative 3 as y plus 3 equals 0? And I could rewrite y equals 5 as y minus 5 equals 0. Same thing with just a single plane, like look over to the left, that plane x equals 2. I could have also written x minus 2 equals 0. That would have been equivalent, right? Okay, now look at that y plus 3 equals 0 or y minus 5 equals 0. Isn't it algebraically true that that's the same thing as saying y plus 3 times y minus 5 equals 0? That's the same as y plus 3 equals 0 or y minus 5 equals 0, right? I mean, think about it. When you're solving quadratic things, like if I put x squared minus 3x plus, no, sorry, rather, minus 4 equals 0, wouldn't you factor that and write x minus 4 times x plus 1? equals 0, and then once you rewrite that as x minus 4 equals 0, or x plus 1 equals 0, right? You've been doing that since high school. What I did there in black is the same thing that I've done in gray, just in the other direction is all. Okay? So what do you think you would get if you wrote this equation? Let's just write over here. z minus 1 times z plus 2 times z minus 4 equals 0. What do you think the graph of that equation would look like? It would be three planes, right? The planes z equals 1, along with the plane z equals negative 2, along with the plane z equals 4. Correct? Which are planes that are perpendicular to the z-axis. Now what about planes that are not perpendicular to any of the axes, but are in fact at an angle? We're going to have to talk about those later, okay? Let's not worry about that today. Okay, now we're going to talk about things called cylinders. You probably already have an idea of what a cylinder means, but the definition that we use in multivariate calculus is not what you usually think of. You usually think of a cylinder as a tube, right? Like a paper towel tube. But the word cylinder actually refers to basically anything that stretches. Um, if, you, if you take any graph of a function, okay, and then project it infinitely in two opposite directions. All right, now what do I mean by that? Okay, let me show you something. I'm going to show you a graph of a parabola in the yz plane. Okay, that is the parabola z equals y squared. Okay, just like when you used to see the parabola a lot, y equals x squared. This is the same thing, except it it's z equals y squared, okay? So it's in the zy plane, not the xy plane. Okay, now, I'm going to draw a bunch of red lines perpendicular to that. Now, those red lines did not have to be perpendicular to the blue parabola. They could have been at any angle, as long as they're not parallel to the parabola. 
Okay. Now, if we took all of those red lines, do you kind of see a shape that they're tracing out? It's kind of like a sheet of paper bent into a parabola, isn't it? Do you see how you get that shape there? And that is called, let's do this in gray, okay? Well, maybe purple. That is called a parabolic cylinder. It's a cylinder because it goes forever. Um, well, I should say this. It started with the parabola, and then that parabola was projected forward and backwards. Okay? That's a parabolic cylinder. That parabola right in the center there, you see it right here, okay, that's called the directrix because that's the, that's the graph that this uh, cylinder was formed from. But I want to point something out to you though. I could have drawn many parabolas along here, couldn't I? In fact, each of these lines right here is a copy of that parabola, isn't it? And those have a name. Those are called traces. Just draw these in here for you. Okay, those are called traces. They're copies of the original parabola. And the cylinder, which is that folded sheet there, that cylinder is actually infinitely many parabolas all stacked in a way that one is stacked in front of the other. Okay? These red lines those are called rules. And the rules in the picture would be lines like this. Okay? So you can have a cylinder of any shape whatsoever. Let me show you another one. There's a picture of a cylinder that looks like a wavy sheet. And is parallel to the y-axis. Here's the directrix that they started with, and that is, I don't know if you recognize that or not. Can you tell? Maybe not. I'm, I don't know. If I write it down, I think it'll make sense. That's x equals sine of z. Do you see a sine curve there? And then here they've drawn a bunch of rules. So you can start to see what the cylinder will look like. And then here's the actual cylinder. And believe it or not, the equation of that directrix is actually the equation of the cylinder. And the reason why is because, once again, all of those points on that cylinder have one thing in common. They all have different y values, and they all have different x and z values, but the one thing they all have in common is that the x value is equal to the sine of the z value. Okay? 
So if I said x equals sine of z and I told you that that's in a two-dimensional picture, x equals sine of z in a two-dimensional picture, then you would picture a flat sine wave in the xz plane. If I tell you the equation x equals z in three dimensions, then you would picture a sinusoidal cylinder. Okay? And just to convince you that this isn't actually any different from what you already thought of as a cylinder, let's go ahead and look at that real quick. Here's a circular cylinder. Okay? You see, you see the traces are all circles, right? The directrix is a circle. You see that one right, right here in the middle. But there's other copies of that. Those are called traces. Okay? You stack those circles on top of each other, you get a circular cylinder. The equation of this one is x squared plus y squared equals 1 because each of those circles has that equation. That's the equation of the traces. Okay? And when you take all of those circles and stack them on top of each other, they all have different z coordinates, but what they all have in common is the x and y coordinates satisfy the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Can you see the rules in this picture? There are these lines going up and down. Those are the rules. Some people like to picture a cylinder by picturing all of the rules standing next to each other, forming the cylinder. Some people like that, and, and other people prefer to picture the traces stacked on top of each other. One really quick thing, the rules do not have to be perpendicular to the traces. You can do something like this, draw a circle, and then make the rules at an angle. Like this. And then the traces would be like that, and you would have a slanted cylinder. That's not a very good picture, but you have to use your imagination a little bit. Okay, one last topic. What would the surface of revolution look like? Um, we've seen those before, okay? And you know that they, they do, they stand out in three dimensions, right? Because when you take something that's in a plane and then you spin it around one of the axes, it actually then comes out into three dimensions. But we've never talked about the equations of those things. So let's talk about that now. Let's look at a picture of a surface of revolution. Okay, there's a surface of revolution that was taken by spinning a curve around the x-axis. Do you see the original curve? It's a blue half of a parabola right there. Do you see it? So that looks to me like it was... probably y equals the square root of x. And then they spun that around the x-axis and you get that cup shape like a like a wine glass line on its side, okay? All right. So let's think about what what would an equation like that look like? Well, let's let's cut that goblet in two places, perpendicular to the axis. Okay, look at that second picture. So they've taken two planes and sliced through the goblet in two different locations, perpendicular to the axis. And you see what you get is a circle, right? Do you agree with that? Now, 
each of those circles is going to have a radius. That big circle has a radius. That small circle has a radius. It's not the same radius though, is it? But for right now, let's just write R for both of those. Now, those are each circles, right? In which directions? In the YZ directions, correct? Do you agree with that? So, each of those circles is going to have an equation that looks like Y squared plus Z squared equals R squared. Those red circles won't have any X in their equation, okay? Because they're parallel to the YZ axis. Every point on either one of those circles, every point on the circle has the same X coordinate. So X won't show up in the equation, you see. Okay? But here's the catch, though. The radius of the circles changes as x changes, doesn't it? As x gets bigger, the radius is getting bigger. So it's actually not correct to just call them both r and to write y squared plus z squared equals r squared because the radius is actually a function of x. It changes as x changes. As x gets bigger, the radius gets bigger. So instead of r squared, I need to write r of x squared. Okay, and that is what the equation of that surface of revolution would look like. I don't know what r of x is, okay, because they didn't, they didn't quite give me that information. But the point is, this is the point I want you to get. Any equation of the form y squared plus z squared equals a function of x squared is a surface of revolution that is revolved around the x-axis. Okay, and here's something else I can say about that. This function, r of x, is actually the curve that was revolved in order to form the surface of revolution. So let me update this. Let me update this sentence first of all, okay? In equation of the form x squared plus c squared equals r of x squared is a surface of revolution that is formed by revolving I could write y equals r of x or I could write z equals r of x. Either way, it wouldn't matter. Around the x-axis. Okay, so in this particular uh, example, I, I said they didn't give me enough information for the r of x, and they didn't, but I, I think I can assume 
that that parabola right there, I think that's probably y equals x squared. So r of x would be x squared. Oh, sorry. I said x squared, but I meant square root of x. Okay. And we can say something similar about, uh, you know, surfaces revolved around the y or the z axis. Let me just put this up here. Let's copy this. We could say any equation of the form x squared plus c squared equals r of y squared is a surface of revolution that's formed by revolving x equals r of y or z equals r of y around the y-axis. And any equation of the form x squared plus y squared equals r of z squared is a surface of revolution that is formed by revolving x equals r of z or y equals r of z around the z-axis. Okay, so if I were to write something like x squared plus z squared equals 5y plus 2 squared, then you know what I've done. I've taken the line, let's just say, x equals 5y plus 2. And I've re re revolved that around the y-axis. Okay? All right, that's all for this section, for this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll still be in the same section of the book. It'll be a second lecture from that section, which is section 11.1. .1.